Welcome to today's Grade 12 Accounting Show on Budgets and Assets. We have selected highlights from lessons shown early in the term to help you revise and prepare for your June exams. You can download the notes for today's show from learnextra.co.za forward slash live. Now it's time to get on with today's lesson. Please post your comments and questions on our Facebook page on facebook.com forward slash learnextra or on Twitter at learnextra so we can help you with your revision. Right, guys, firstly, the question, what is a cash budget? Now, the term cash, remember, guys, the term cash deals with receiving money versus spending that money, making certain, uh, certain payments. So the actual definition of a cash budget, it is a forecast. The word forecast, you're looking into the future you are trying to predict, looking into the future, of the cash position of a business over a future period, a future period of time, setting out expected cash receipts as well as expected cash payments over that period of time. So. Once again, guys, this word expected, expected something that hasn't happened as yet. But how much of cash do I expect to receive to go into my bank account and how that cash is going to be spent? What will be the expected payments that will be made from my bank account? Right. The next question. Why is it important? to prepare a cash budget. Now, AB, let me ask you, why do you think it's necessary for you to prepare a cash budget? Well, to, uh, to manage your finances. Good. At the same time, to manage your cash, because you, you don't want your, your money to be all around. So that could be, a, a, and also allocating essential stuff, prioritizing, it is a good way of structuring that. Okay, absolutely brilliant. So you will obviously prioritize certain um, key expenses that you've got to pay for. So mm. you obviously need to pay for your fuel, you need to pay for your rent, um, you need to buy airtime. food, mm. you need to buy <laughs> airtime, um, and then, Maybe if there's money left over, do I'm going to do some savings. Mm. I was going to say I'm going to go out and watch a movie <laughs> with my friends <laughs> or whatever the case may be. Yes. Right, so let's look at it from a business point of view, guys. A cash budget is firstly an essential tool that is used to monitor and plan the liquidity of the business enterprise. The term liquidity, guys, remember we came across this when we looked at ratio analysis, and liquidity looks at short-term debt, short-term payments. By analyzing the cash budget, a business is able to see whether there is sufficient cash Sufficient, obviously, the word sufficient we're looking at, is there enough cash to meet short-term commitments? There's the term liquidity, short-term commitments. Is there enough cash to purchase stock, to purchase additional assets? And here we're talking about fixed assets. To pay for business expenses, etc. Another reason why it is absolutely important to prepare a cash budget in the event of a shortfall of cash, shortfall meaning that if your expenses or your payments rather are more than your receipts, management can make arrangements for an overdraft, obviously with the bank, or they can make alternate plans. Now, when we talk about alternate plans, you can, for example, if you are planning to buy equipment, which is a fixed asset using cash, and there is not enough cash in terms of your budget, you can then buy that equipment on credit. Okay, so those are the reasons why it's necessary to, to draw up a cash budget. 
Right, guys, the next concept, absolutely important, expected receipts versus expected payments. Now, immediately, guys, you would notice we are not using the word expected income versus expected expenses because a receipt of cash is not necessarily an income. And if I had to say it the other way around, an income is not necessarily a receipt of cash. Okay, you guys got that. Same would apply to a payment. A payment is not necessarily an expense, and also an expense is not necessarily a payment. So remember, if you are doing a projected income statement, which I'm sure we're going to focus on in the weeks to come, then we would be looking at expected income versus expected expenses. But because we're focusing on cash, we are looking at future receipts of money versus future payments of actual cash or money. Right, let's start off with expected receipts. And when we talk about receipts, guys, we are talking about an inflow of cash, money coming into your bank account. Money comes into your bank account from cash sales. So when the business sells for cash, they expect money to go into their bank account. Receipts from debtors. So when your debtors pay their accounts, when you're receiving money from your debtors, that is a receipt of cash. Interest that is received. So you may have a fixed deposit or some kind of investment, and the interest that you receive on that fixed deposit is an expected receipt. Rent income that is also received. Proceeds from the sale of fixed assets. This is also something very, very important. And this is where the term income and receipt, I can give you guys a very, very good example of the difference between these two very important concepts. Proceeds from the sale of fixed assets would be the receipt of cash, whereas the profit made on selling that asset would be your income. So remember that, guys. Then, if the business takes out an additional loan, taking out an additional future loan, that is another receipt of cash, and also a fixed deposit that is maturing. Maturing meaning that the term has now expired and the money is now going to come back into your bank account. That would be a definite receipt of cash. All right, let's now look at your payments. Payments would be an outflow of cash from your bank account and examples of payments, cash purchase of stock when you buy trading stock, payments that are made to your creditors, payments of operating expenses, for example, your salary that you've got to pay on a monthly basis, your telephone account, those would be all our operating expenses, your water and electricity, etc. Cash drawings. Okay, now remember, guys, the term drawings, money taken by the owner for personal use. And when we're drawing up a cash budget, we are focusing on only the cash that is taken by the owner, the physical cash that he takes from the business on a monthly basis. Any cash purchase of fixed assets, repayments of loans or repayments of any interest on loans, and then finally creating a fixed deposit is an example of an expected payment. Okay. All right, the next concept, guys, that I want to focus on before we go to an actual example or exercise on the cash budget is your format of your cash budget. 
Okay, now you would have noticed I haven't put up a format here, guys. That's because you've been doing this from grade 10. You've done it in grade 10, you've done it in grade 11. So this is a very quick recap of what um, the main subheadings are in that cash budget. Okay, the first subheading that you're going to come across when you do draw up your cash budget will be one for your receipts. So receipts, one more time, guys. It's a forecast of all cash receipts or inflows for the budget period itself. The next subheading, expected payments, a forecast of all your cash payments or your outflows for that budget period. Then we are able to work out whether, let's go for green, whether we've got a cash surplus or a cash shortfall. And again, guys, I'm sure you've come across these terms before. Cash surplus is money that is left over. Cash shortfall, obviously the word shortfall, clearly an indication that your payments are much more than your actual receipt. So let's look at that definition. A surplus arises when the expected receipts are greater, so your expected receipts are greater than your payments. A shortfall, on the other hand, arises when payments are much greater than your receipts. Right, guys, um, before we took a break, we were ready to tackle our question on budgets. But before we do that, one very last concept that I need to go through is your non-cash items. Now, remember the word, oh, this pen, oh, it's, it's probably me. And my it's excitement after today. watching you're, the movie. You're so exci you're the, too excited. The trailer, <laughs> probably. <laughs> right, non-cash items, guys. Um, these are items that have absolutely no impact on cash whatsoever. So we need to be aware of these items because these items might be in um, your exam question on cash budgets. And you need to remember, when you come across these non-cash items, I need to make sure that I do not include these in my cash budget. What are these non-cash items? I'm talking about depreciation trading stock deficit, then you have your profit or your loss on sale of assets. There are a few more non-cash items, but these are the most important one, ones, guys, that you need to be aware of. You need to remember not to include them in your cash budget. Okay, guys, I hope you're enjoying this revision session. If you are struggling and need help, remember to post on the page or send an email to helpdesk at learnextra.co.za. We have got such exciting news for you. From July, a new program starts on Mindset just for you. It's called Connections. We'll chat about the issues that affect your life, your school, and your relationships. We'll have fun, take your calls, and have great prizes up for grabs. Connections, from the 1st of July, half past seven in the evening, only on Mindset. For you, by you. Welcome back from the break. I know you can't wait for the term to end and the July holidays to start. And of course, that means winter school. This year, we will be bringing you special exam revision sessions from the 1st to the 5th of July from 9 a.m. in the morning till 7 p.m. at night. We'll also be repeating the programs from 9.30 p.m. every evening. So don't miss out. If you want to do exam revision with other learners and get help from expert tutors, you can register for our winter school classes at a PC training center near you. Just go to our website, www.learnextra.co.za forward slash classes to get all the details. But for now, let's get back to revision. Over to you. The two ledger accounts dealing specifically with input that and output that. These are two very, very important concepts. So you need to make sure, grade 12s, that you understand these concepts clearly. 
we need to know that input bet represents the amount that we can claim back from SARS on the items that we have bought. So I'm running a business and I buy various things or I pay for various services. I'm going to pay that of 14% on most of those. What then happens is that money I'm allowed to claim back from SARS at the end of the period because that represents that that I have paid on my inputs. So therefore, what that means is that input that is an asset. That is very, very important. It is an asset because it represents the money that you are allowed to claim back from SARS at the end of the period. This is very similar to a debtor. A debtor is somebody who owes you money, and we know that debtor's control is also an asset. You will remember that from grade 10 accounting. So input that is simply the amount of money that SARS owes us, therefore it is an asset. And what's very important as well is that you remember you can only claim this input that back on items that are not exempt from that. So you need to go and learn a list of what items are exempt from that and what items you can claim input that on. If you don't know those distinctions, you're likely to make some mistakes in the exam. And we, when we go through the activity, I'm going to stress that in detail. Also, please be very aware of this little point here. It says input that is found in the journals, the CPJ, the CJ, the CIJ, and the PCJ. What do all four of those journals have in common? Very easy. We use these journals when we either buy items, like the CPJ, the CJ, and the PCJ, or when we return items that we have bought. So these journals, when we're dealing with input that, we're interested in items that we have bought or items that we have returned to creditors. So the numbers dealing with input that are going to be found in those four journals. Now output that, of course, is going to be the opposite. If we're looking at output that, output that is the VAT that we must pay to SARS. So what will happen, I'm a business, I sell some products, and I'm going to collect some money from the customers that have bought from me. Of that money that I collect, 14% will have to go to the government because output that is charged on the items that I sell. So whenever I sell something, I'm going to have to record what part must go to the government from the money that I've collected. So what that means is that output that is a liability. We owe that money to SARS. Where we find the output that is in the journals that we deal with when we are selling things. Remember, I can sell items for cash or I can sell them on credit. If I sell them for cash, my entry will be in the CRJ. If I sell them on credit, my entry will be in the DJ. So these two journals record the value of items that we sell, and because we owe the government the VAT that we have collected on the items that we sell, we will pay it over, and therefore we will find output VAT in these two journals. In the same way, the DAJ is included in output VAT. That is because the DAJ is used when we return, pardon, when a debtor returns items to us that he or she has previously bought from us. So the DAJ also deals with items that we have sold that are now being returned to us. What we therefore need to know is that the DAJ will also deal with output that. One simple way of remembering which one is which, if you look at the word input, you will see that it has five letters, I-N-P-U-T, and we also know that the word asset has five letters. That is an easy way of remembering it. The shorter word input has the same number of letters as asset, and we also know that input that will go up on the debit side, because you should know from your accounting equation, assets go up on the debit side and down on the credit side. So we are going to expect input that to have a debit balance. Quite conveniently, the words input, asset, and debit, if you look at them, they all have five letters. So that's an easy way of remembering which one is which. For our output that, we know that the word output has six letters, and so does the word credit, because we're going to expect the balance on output that to be on the credit side of the ledger because it is a liability. And we know that liabilities go up on the credit side. 
Very, very important for you to know on which side your input that is and on which side your output that is because you're going to need this information to answer questions in the exam. Just a couple more points that I want to mention here. The business is going to act as a tax collector for SARS. So what would happen when we sell stock, we actually are collecting some VAT on behalf of SARS, and at the end of the two-month period, we're going to send SARS that output VAT. But we're also going to be able to claim back the input VAT that we have originally paid. Also what's important is that there is a third VAT account that you have to know about, which is the VAT control account. You've all seen it in the textbooks. We need to know that the VAT control account is a summary of the input and the output VAT accounts. So really what's going to happen, at the end of the accounting period, we are going to close off our input VAT and we're going to close off our output VAT to appear on the VAT control account. The main use of this VAT control account is written here for you. We use it to calculate the amount that must be paid to SARS or the amount that can be claimed back from SARS. Very, very easy. Remember, our output VAT is the VAT that we have to pay to SARS. Our input VAT is the VAT that we can claim back from SARS. If our output VAT is greater than our input VAT, it means we owe SARS more than we can claim back. Therefore, at the end of the period, we will send SARS a check. But in the explanation of the task that we're going to do together, you will see how this works. Just remember that you're going to prepare the VAT control account to try and calculate the amount either that SARS owes us or that we owe SARS at the end of the month. Just remember the format of the VAT ledger accounts. Learn those very, very carefully because those are essential in understanding the section. And you're going to need it when you answer questions in the exam. Now it's time for a break. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back guys. I hope you are getting into the idea of revision. Please let us know how you are doing. I'd love to chat to you on the page or on Twitter. Enough of the chat. Let's get back to revision. What we need to know if we're thinking about our definition of fixed assets. We really have got two types of assets and they are non-current and current assets. Non-current assets are typically assets that we want to keep in our business for a long period of time, something that we're going to use for a long period of time. So if you have a look at Megan with her laptop over there, Megan, are you going to use that laptop just for one day? No. Definitely not. We're going to use that laptop over and over and over again. Yes. So that would form something like a non-current asset. It's something that we expect to keep for at least a year in the business. However, if you were to get some trading stock in your business, are you going to keep that trading stock for an entire year before you sell it? No. Definitely not, because otherwise you'd be wasting your time, you keep the stock on the shelves, and you don't make any money. So trading stock would be something that's a current asset because you want to sell it and convert it to cash within a period of time. That's usually shorter than a year. Now we usually divide non-current assets up into two parts. They can be fixed assets and they can be financial assets. Where mindsetters have you seen this before? I'll tell you where. You've seen it on the balance sheet. When you are drawing up your balance sheet, you have a section on non-current assets, and there is a part for fixed assets, and there is a part for financial assets. So your fixed assets are usually divided into three different things. You have land and buildings, you have vehicles, and you have equipment. You can remember those three because land and buildings is L, V for vehicles, E for equipment, and everybody just will love accounting if they remember that. So remember, L, V, and E will give you your fixed assets. That computer that we have here, this laptop, that would count as a piece of equipment. So remember, equipment is all your machinery, it would be all your light fittings, all your furniture. Vehicles, on the other hand, would cover anything that you can drive in, such as trucks, delivery vehicles, it could also be something like a scooter or a motorbike that the business uses for delivery. And then finally, land and buildings, would be a piece of land or it would be something with a structure on it, like an office, a shop, anything that has been built. So those are our three fixed assets. And the other section of non-current assets are what we call financial assets. Financial assets are easy to remember. They are just the assets that you have that are money investments. So for instance, we could put money into the bank as a fixed deposit. 
Megan, if you put money in the bank for a fixed deposit, are you intending to draw it out tomorrow? No. Usually not. That's what we use our current accounts for. What we do with the fixed deposit is we leave it in the bank for a period of time, and the longer you leave it in, the more interest it, it gets. So a fixed deposit will be a type of financial asset. It will be non-current because we will try to leave it in the bank for a long period of time in order to earn interest. What you must just be careful of remembering is that some fixed assets are not, sorry, some fixed deposits are non-current assets. That is if we are intending to leave them in the bank for longer than a year. But let's say that that year then passes and next month there's a fixed deposit that's going to expire. You must remember there's a little trick on the balance sheet. That fixed deposit then becomes a current asset if it has less than a year until maturity. So they are only non-current assets if they have more than a year until maturity. So make sure you understand the difference between that because you often get an adjustment that involves that. Also, please remember that fixed assets depreciate. Depreciation is something that happens to all fixed assets. Things get old, things get used. Through wear and tear, items lose their value. So even though Megan is taking care of that computer, she's not going to be able to sell that laptop at the same price that it was bought for. Why not? Because it's got old. People have used it. There's another reason, though, why fixed assets depreciate, and this is also something that I'm sure you'll remember. Fixed assets can become obsolete. What that means is that new technology or new products that are better actually become available. In the past, people used to listen to music on records. Then there were cassettes. Then there were CDs. Now you have MP3 players that can let you listen to music. So nobody is really going to buy a cassette tape anymore. This is because old technology has been replaced by better technology. So remember that assets can also depreciate when new and better items come out to replace them. So that's some theory on fixed assets. And we'll now move to the calculation of depreciation. That is something very, very important. And mindsetters, I'm sure you've done this since grade 11, but remember to revise it before your final exam because it can come up in many different questions. It can come up in adjustments. It can come up in your cash flow statement, and it can come up in other questions on fixed assets. So what you need to remember is that there are two methods. Our first method of calculating depreciation is the method that is on cost. So here is the formula. It might be a little bit different to the formula that you have in your textbook because different textbooks have got different ways of explaining it. But if you're calculating depreciation on cost, all you do is you take the cost price of the asset, you multiply it by your interest rate, divide by 100. So we are over here in my formula is my interest rate. And then you multiply it by the number of months that you have kept the asset in the business for and divide it by 12. And usually you calculate depreciation at the end of a financial year or you will calculate it when you sell an asset. But this is just a quick recap of what you should know from grade 11. There's a second method of calculating depreciation, and that is your diminishing balance method. Your diminishing balance method is the one that's a little bit more tricky because there's a small difference. If you look at my first example on cost, I take the cost price, multiply it by the depreciation rate, multiply it by the number of months, and divide it by 12. If I'm doing the diminishing balance method, it's slightly different. So please note this difference. Instead of using the cost price, I am going to use the carrying value. The rest of the equation stays the same. I multiply by my interest rate divided by 100. Sorry, it's the depreciation rate because we're calculating depreciation. We're not calculating interest. And then we multiply again by the number of months and divide by 12. So you can see that the only difference between the two methods is that the one is calculated on the cost price and the other one is calculated on the carrying value. What is the carrying value? I'm sure you remember that from grade 11 accounting. So please, I'd like you to send us a message. Send us one on Facebook. Let Megan and me know how to calculate depreciation using the carrying value. What is the formula for calculating the carrying value? I'm sure you know it. Send it in to us and we'll announce the answer a little bit later. Okay, now another important key concept is the disposal of fixed assets. 
And this, I would say, is something that's very, very important to revise. Some people might forget to revise it because it is a grade 11 topic, but it is something that will definitely be asked to you in some way in your matric exams. So what is important about this is to learn the format of the asset disposal account. I'm not going to do this in a lot of detail. I'm just going to talk you through the various steps that you need to do, but make sure that you understand and that you know this format. So the asset disposal account over here, this is a ledger account, but I've just blown it up to look a bit bigger so that you can see what goes on either side. Remember, the first thing that you do is you put the cost price of your fixed asset. That's the cost price of the asset that you're wanting to sell. That will always go on the debit side of your asset disposal account. I'm sure you remember that from grade 11 accounting. Then what you do is on the date of the sale, you calculate the total accumulated depreciation on that vehicle or that piece of equipment that you're selling, and you record that over here on the credit side. So we've already got the cost price over here, and we've got the accumulated depreciation. At any time, what you can then do is subtract the one side from the other, and that's going to give you something which I'm going to tell you about a little bit later, was the question that I previously asked. There's a hint for you. Now, what then happens is your third step is to fill in the credit side of the asset disposal account, and that can be done in one of at least five different ways. It's going to depend on how you sell the asset. I can sell my equipment or my vehicle for cash. If I sell it for cash, then the details that I'm going to write are going to be bank, because we record the cash that we receive in our bank accounts. So if you sell it for cash, the details that you write here are bank, because bank is your contra account. I don't have to sell it for cash, though. I could sell it to a debtor. I could sell it on credit. If I do that, then the details are going to be debtor's control. So what we will do is we will debit debtor's control and credit the asset disposal account. This is what you would do if the vehicle or the equipment that you're selling is being sold on credit. Then we have creditors control. This one we're going to use if we are trading the vehicle in or if we're trading the equipment in. And then finally, there are at least two other possibilities. There are drawings. Drawings are going to result when the owner takes the equipment or the vehicle out for personal use. And donations, this is what's going to happen if we should donate the vehicle or the equipment to charity. Now, the last step that you do, once you've filled in all the information that you have, the very last step that you do is calculate either the profit on the sale of the asset or the loss on the sale of the asset. So what you would do is you would balance this ledger account out. You all know how to balance ledger accounts. You've done it since grade 10. But instead of working out a balance brought down or a balance carried down, what you're going to do is calculate a profit or a loss on the sale. So if the balancing figure ends up on the credit side, you have made a loss on the sale of the asset. But if the balancing figure ends up on the debit side, you have made a profit. The only way you'll know that is once you've filled in all the necessary information and calculated whether you've made a profit or whether you've made a loss. So that's the asset disposal account. And I've said here, very, very important, revise your grade 11 work. Make sure you know how to complete the asset disposal account. And it's often asked not as a specific question where the question says to you, draw up this asset disposal account. No, very often it's asked to you in the form of an adjustment. So you might get an incomplete financial statement or a pre-adjustment trial balance where you have to do some or other adjustment where the inexperienced bookkeeper forgot to calculate depreciation or didn't do something correctly. Then the examiner is not going to give you an asset disposal account to draw up. Instead, you will have to calculate those numbers in a certain way. And the easy way to do that, simply draw up your own asset disposal account somewhere on your page, get the necessary numbers, and use them to calculate whichever number you're looking for. Also, sometimes it gets asked in the section on companies. Other times it gets asked as a cash flow statement question. Make sure you realize and make sure that you've worked through as many past papers as you can before tackling your final exam because you'll see that this depreciation comes up everywhere. One more thing that I need to remind you of, very important, another component of grade 11 work that you'll need to revise, 
go over note three on the balance sheet. Note three is that note on the balance sheet which tells you about the fixed assets. Learn its format, know it well, so that when you come into the exam, you're able to fill in all of the numbers from top to bottom, with the cost price, the carrying value, and so forth. You know where to find this information in your textbook, you know where to find past examples, make sure you try them and understand the format of this account. Now it's time for a break, so don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back, Mindsetters. In case you missed my news, starting in July, we have a new program that is going to get you talking. What's on your mind? What are the issues you deal with? How can we help you? Connections will help you with all that and more, so make sure you catch it. For a fun and youthful look at life, connect with us on Connections. But right now, let's do some more revision. First of all, as I've said it before, these methods are applied when we want to value our trading stock. We've got other assets in the business. We've got land and buildings. We've got vehicles. We've got equipment. Those things can also be valued, but we use different ways. What we're doing in accounting here is valuing only our trading stock. Okay? It might sometimes be challenging to value our trading stock. So you know, Abram, when we go shopping, what happens to prices? They're constantly on the rise. Mm -hmm. And it makes it very, very hard to keep up with what the value of something is. Mindset is, I'm sure you've experienced this in your daily life. You would go to a shop, you buy a Coke, and then a couple of months later or years later, you come back and then the price has risen. Okay? That can happen very, very fast, and it is difficult to value what your trading stock is really worth if prices are continually rising. Because let's say I bought some stock... I'm a supplier, right? And I buy some stock which I want to resell at the end of the month. And then I buy some more stock because I've sold some of the stock that I bought, but I buy the new stock at a higher price. The challenge comes in to know what is my stock worth at any given point in time. Am I going to use the cheaper price that I bought the stock at or am I going to use the more expensive price? I need to figure out and know a method of valuing my trading inventory. So we know that in our economy, we've had some bad news in South Africa that in the recent times, the rand has depreciated. It's gone to almost 10 rand to the dollar. So what's going to happen to products that we import from overseas? The prices are going to go up. If the prices rise or if the prices change, we are going to experience a challenge to value our trading stock. How much is the stock that is on our shelves worth? So, as a result, we've got two methods to do this. The one is called FIFO, and the other one is called Weighted Average. There is a third method that you can also use, and Abram, I'd like to maybe ask the mindsetters to write into Facebook and tell us if you've heard of the third method. It's a third method of valuing stock. It's almost like FIFO, but there's a small difference. And let's see if any of our mindsetters know that, please write to us on the Facebook page and tell me what's the third method of stock valuation, and I'll tell you what that is afterwards. But remember, that's the one that you are not allowed to use in South Africa because that's the one that SARS does not allow. So the two that you are going to study and that you're going to have to know how to do are the FIFO method and the weighted average method. And what we do is when we start a business, we choose a method, but this method chosen should be used consistently. What do I mean by consistently? I mean we're not going to change that method. So from year to year, we need to use the same method to value the stock. I've asked here a question, why is that the case? Throughout our business, we shouldn't really change the stock valuation systems. Why should we keep things constant? Why should we value things according to the same way? The main reason is so that we can make good comparisons from one year to the next. So I might want to know what is my trading stock worth this year and then I want to compare it to what my trading stock is worth next year. If I use a different stock valuation method, I'm going to get misleading results. So the reason that we use the method consistently is to compare information regarding the business from one year to the next. We want to make sure that the method that we've chosen stays the same. 
Okay, now that I've talked about the theory behind it, let's look at the key concepts and the key characteristics. I already have your answers. Oh, you do? What's, yeah. what's your There's answer? There's one from Karabo Mukele which says it's the third method is the LIFO. Last Lipo in, method. first out. Excellent. Well done. You're quite right. That third method is called the LIFO or LIFO method, which stands for last in, first out. Very good. I see somebody has already been studying their accounting. Well done. If we look at FIFO, though, FIFO and LIFO are similar methods, but the only one that we're allowed to use from SARS is the FIFO method in South Africa. So it stands for first in, first out. F stands for first, then the I for in, then first out. So what that really means is that the stock that came in first is the stock that is going out first. In other words, the stock that was bought first is the stock that is sold first. I don't know, Abram, if you ever go to the shop to buy milk or something like that. Mm -hmm. When you go to the shop to buy milk, you know the milk has got an expiry date. You yes. see the expiry date. Yes. And usually, the way the shop packs the milk is in such a way that if you want the milk with the longest expiry date, <laughs> what do you have to do? Have to you dig you through have to the go, other... Yeah, on the, on the shelves, look, they, they hide it. They hide it. They mm. put it all the way at the back. Yes. Why? Because they want you to take the oldest milk first. More like bread. I've noticed that a lot. You've noticed that a yes. lot. So the freshest bread, they always hide somewhere yes. in the back so that you <laughs> take the, the oldest bread you take out first. That is because the shop is using the FIFO waiting system. The stock that they've bought first is the stock that they want to sell first. In other words, the first stock that came in is the first stock to come out. The first bread that was baked is the first bread to go out. We know all about it. You just have to visit your local supermarket to see that. <laughs> so the result of this is that our closing stock is going to be valued at the most recent price. When I mean closing stock, I'm talking about the stock that is left over at the end of the month. In other words, it's a stock that's unsold. I, as a business, want to know what the value of that stock is. And the result of using FIFO is that the first stock that comes in will be the first stock that goes out. So what that means is that the closing stock will be valued at the most recent price. And you'll see how this works later on when we go through an activity together. Also, mindsetters, this type of stock valuation system is suitable for any type of business. So it doesn't matter if you're a grocery store or a computer store or an electronics store or even a car dealership. Anything like that can use the FIFO method. But it is most often used by businesses that sell perishable goods. In other words, why would the shop want to sell the old bread first? Because the longer it keeps the old bread on the shelves, the longer or the faster that bread is going to go off. So they want to sell it, they want the consumer to buy it and take it home and eat it before that bread goes stale or goes old. So perishable goods will often use the FIFO system. And this next note tells you exactly what we've just been talking about. The shops will display their trading stock in such a way as to encourage customers to purchase the oldest stock first. We want our oldest stock to leave our shelves first, so the supermarket will probably give instructions to the packers, put the old stock near the front so that the customer comes in, just grabs the milk, and they've grabbed the milk that has the longest, or sorry, the shortest expiry date. In other words, the milk that came in first. And this is also realistic. It's a realistic stock valuation system because the stock values at the end of the year are valued at the most recent prices. So it's no use buying something at the beginning of the year that costs 10 rand, and then you sell it, and at the end of the year, the price has doubled or tripled, and it's cost 50 rand, and you're trying to value what the value of your stock on your shelves is. It's going to be worth at the latest price, not at the price at the beginning, because the price has changed throughout the year. Okay, so that's the FIFO method. Let's look now at the second method of stock, which is the characteristics of the weighted average method. So mindset is, I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of an average. Everybody always gets average marks for their subjects. They, they work out their averages for a term and so on and so forth. And in stock valuation, we have a method called the weighted average method. Sometimes teachers abbreviate it as the word WAM, standing for weighted average method. What you do with the weighted average method is you calculate your stock value by 
dividing. Do you know with an average, you usually take all the numbers together and divide it by something to get an answer? Or you divide it by the number of values that you have? You would have used the term average sometimes when you're calculating uh, certain financial ratios. So you would, for example, put average owner's equity at the bottom of a ratio if you are calculating your return ratio. Okay? This lesson is not about calculating your return on equity, but the formula for return on equity, I'm sure you all know it, it's equal to net profit after tax over average owner's equity. So the owner's equity at the bottom is the average owner's equity. Here we are using something similar, which is the weighted average method for valuing stock. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide, let me use a different color to highlight that clearly, the total cost of all the merchandise that we have. So what everything that we have of that kind, what it cost us, we're going to divide it by the number of units, and that's going to give us the weighted average. So you'll see just now how that works. And what that means is that your high prices are averaged with your low prices. So think about when you're writing a subject and you do, say, two or three tests in a term for a particular subject. If you get a low mark in one test and you get a higher mark in the other test, those two are averaged out, and you're going to get a mark that's somewhere in between. The same is going to happen when we do the weighted average method. Our high prices are going to be averaged with the low prices. So what that means is that we get an average price throughout the time period for what our stock is worth. But the one disadvantage is that it might not reflect your current market conditions, especially in a time such as now when the RAND is depreciated and importing products has become more expensive for us. What sometimes is going to happen is we're going to pay higher prices than we paid before. So if we take the average, we do not necessarily always have a realistic measure of what that stock is worth at this period in time. So what you need to do, mindsetters, please remember that there are advantages and disadvantages to both methods. Go back, look at your notes, compare them to what I've said here today, and make sure that you know your theory very, very well. Because you need to be able to compare and contrast and comment on our two stock valuation methods. Just to mention what the LIFO is, we had some correct answers about LIFO. If you're doing the LIFO method, what that is, is it stands for last in, first out. So sometimes you could be asked to just describe that last in, first out. That is just basically going to be the opposite of first in, first out. What that means is the stock that came in last will be the first stock to leave. But remember, you won't be using that in South Africa, and you won't have to calculate it. You just have to know about its existence. Okay. So, Abram, I think we've got time just to look at the first question. Yes, please. So, the first question that we've got for you here is... Oh, I've forgotten to do something. What you need to do, your key outcomes here that you have to learn, and make sure you go over this. You need to be able to value the number of units on hand. What that means is if I've sold a lot of things and I want to know how many of them are left over, I will be calculating the number of units on hand. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes with a practical example how that gets done. The second thing that usually gets asked for you is to calculate the value of the closing stock according to both methods or one method. So they're either going to ask you to do it according to FIFO or according to weighted average or both and make sure that you know how to do them and compare them. Then it's not only your closing stock, you would also need to calculate your cost of sales. And again, you'd have to do that according to both methods. And then one other important thing is that you have to make sure that you calculate the gross profit according to both methods. Okay, the gross profit has got a special formula, and I'd like to ask all you mindsetters out there, please send us the formula on Facebook. I want to see if you know what the formula is. Tell us what the formula is to calculate our gross profit, and then you'll see how it differs between the two methods. We've come to the end of today's show. Thanks for joining me and for chatting to me during the show. Don't forget to join us for Learn Extra Winter School from the 1st till the 5th of July, when we'll bring you 
Great revision with live shows during the day. We'll also be repeating all Term 2 Learn Extra live shows from the 8th till the 12th of July so you'll be ready for Term 3 and your prelim exams. Remember that if you are stuck on any questions, you can get help by sending an email to helpdesk at learnextra.co.za. We'll be back with live shows from the 15th of July for Term 3 lessons.